Grandad's Wheelies by Jack Lazenby. In a way, all Granny's and Grandad's stories are true. Mum, can I stay at Granny and Grandad's next weekend? If they'll have you. Granny said, ask your mother. I'll give her a ring. Their phone's up on the wall. I have to stand up on a chair. Most phones used to be up on the wall. Mum, Granny and Grandad say feet and inches. Well, that's what they're used to. And pennies and pounds. Grandad says quids. Well, that's what money was called when they were young, before we had dollars and cents. Mum, Granny and Grandad tell stories about each other. It keeps them going. They don't have a telly. They don't like it. Mum, what is it now? I don't know. Mum, did Granny and Grandad tell you stories when you were little? Not as many as they tell you. You know their stories. They throw off at each other. Mum smiled, but kept looking straight ahead. I like their stories, even if they're not true. Mum slowed the car. In a way, she said, turning into her drive, all Granny's and Grandad's stories are true. Jack and the Dragon When I was a boy, Auckland had no roads. Grandad pushed his wheelbarrow out of the shed. Where did the cars go? Cars hadn't been invented yet. Grandad sat down, so the wheelbarrow turned itself into a comfortable chair, his feet on the ground between its handles, the iron wheel turning in midair. Tell us about it. Grandad nodded. Except for the ninnies who got seasick. Most people were quite happy coming and going by boat. Did Granny get seasick? Grandad looked at me and grinned. Don't tell her I called her a ninny. Once upon a time, Auckland boiled. Something white hot burst out of the waves and flew so its shadow darkened the city. Water hissed and steamed off its back. Then the hot rain stopped falling. People closed their umbrellas and saw a colossal, armour-plated dragon curled up on the rock outside the harbour. Gone to sleep like a big friendly dog, the grown-up said, and smiled, the corners of their mouths drawn back, where safe as houses. But a brave boy named Jack saw the seawater bubbling around the iron claws, smoke trickling out of the bronze nostrils, and a secret grin on the scaly mouth. And when everyone else had gone to bed that night, and the monster yawned, Jack saw the sky turn red from the flaming furnaces deep in the dragon's brassy belly. Wake up! Wake up! But by the time the grown-ups woke and looked, it was dark again. Go back to bed. Your idea, waking us up for nothing. In the morning, a whole street full of houses had been burnt down, and the people inside them cooked and eaten. And the next night, the sky turned red again. Another street full of houses burned down. The grown-ups tiptoed past, not looking at the heaps of gnawed white bones. In loud voices they said, There's no such thing as dragons. Grandad looked at me, and I asked, Why didn't the people run away? Told you, no roads, no cars. Planes? Not invented. What about boats? That very night, a ship slipped out of Auckland. But dragons can see in the dark, even with their eyes shut. This one lifted its great armoured head, and it opened its scaly mouth, and it huffed and puffed, and the sky turned red, as it cooked the captain, the crew, and all the passengers with its flaming breath, sprinkled them with salt and pepper, and gobbled and swallowed them greedily down. Crikey! The mayor called all the grown-ups to a meeting on Queen Street, but most pretended there was no dragon, and the others blamed the weather. While they were waving their arms, and not listening to each other, the brave boy called Jack rode out in his dinghy, and before it could smell him, sprayed quick-setting concrete all over the dragon. It spread its enormous wings to fly, but the concrete set hard. The tail, with its poisonous sting, the wings, and the great armoured head drooped into the sea. The rising tide poured into its mouth, damped down the furnaces and the brassy belly, and the dragon turned to stone. Pahutakawa trees grew over it, 
and the mayor named the dragon Rangitoto in memory of the time that it yawned and the sky bled. At school, I told Grandad, Mrs. Johnson told us that Rangitoto is an extinct volcano, and extinct means dead. That's what a lot of people think, Grandad tapped his nose, so I tapped mine back. Anyone can see Rangitoto is really a dragon, curled up asleep, with his head and tail in the water. Grandad pointed at the pointed peaks on top of Rangitoto Island. Spikes dragons grow along their backs, all turned to stone. Is that true? What do you think? I looked at Grandad and nodded. Last Monday, he said, there was a puff of smoke and the sea boiled around Rangitoto. Maybe I didn't spray enough concrete on that old dragon. Were you Jack, Grandad? Grandad didn't hear me. When a dragon wakes up to sleeping for a hundred years, he said, it's hungry. Are you a hundred years old, Grandad? Mm, something like that. Give or take a couple of years. Oh, crikey. That's nothing. Your grandmother can give me a good hundred years. She's twice as old as me. Grandad stood up, put the shovel in his wheelbarrow, pushed it down the garden to dig some potatoes. I ran inside and told Granny the story about Jack and the dragon, and how Grandad was a hundred years old. Did he say anything about my age? He said you could give him a good hundred years. And you believed him. If you've got half a brain in that skull of yours, Granny told me, you won't listen to a word that man says. And she gave a great sniff. False teeth and a wheelbarrow. Once upon a time, said Grandad, everyone used to go by boat between Auckland and Wellington. Before cars were invented... Oh, lots of people had cars. Then why didn't they drive? Roads weren't invented yet. The cars sat in their sheds, and the owners went and sat in the cars and tooted the horn from time to time. Well, that wasn't much use. People buy cars to show how important they are. The bigger the car, the more important the owner. Before roads were invented, rich people built big car sheds and bought huge cars with very loud horns. They sat in their fat cars and tooted their horns and were very important. Grandad laughed. Now, what was I telling you about? About the olden days when roads weren't invented and everyone went by boat between Auckland and Wellington. Ah, that's right. I went down to the wharf one day to meet your grandmother off the Wellington steamer. She was so seasick she cried and begged, Do something about it. That's when I decided to invent the first road. I chopped down trees, dug cuttings, and filled in swamps, built bridges across creeks, and turned rivers so they ran the other way, and all on my own. All on your own? Your grandmother wasn't much use, because she was still seasick. I had no hammer, no axe, and no shovel. Why not? They hadn't been invented. All I had was my wheelbarrow, so building bridges was tricky. I needed both hands to hold up the heavy beams, and when I went down to nail them together, I had to let go, and they fell down. What did you do? I unscrewed my left hand, put it back on the other way around, to hold up the heavy beams, while I hammered in the nails with my right hand. Grandad held up his left hand, backwards, and hammered with his right. I held up my own left hand, turned it around backwards, and hammered with my right. I could see what Grandad meant, but something wasn't right. How did you hold the nails in place? I put them in my mouth, and I spat them into the wood, and then I hammered them home. But hammers weren't invented. I knocked in the nails, chopped down the trees, dug the cuttings, and scooped the dirt into the wheelbarrow with these. Grandad took out his false teeth. Worn right down to the gums. Before I started making the road, my teeth were this long. He held his hands wide apart. But your left hand, it isn't on backwards now. I screwed it back the right way around when I finished building the road from Auckland to Wellington. Did you buy a car? I already had a car in the car shed. Did you used to sit in it and toot the horn? Often. And did you drive it on the road you'd invented? Tooting all the way. I'll bet Granny was pleased she didn't have to get seasick every time she went to Wellington. There's no satisfying some people. My road had too many corners and made her car sick and all the tooting gave her a headache. Tea's poured, Granny called.
Come and drink it while it's still hot. Grandad popped his teeth back in, snapped them at me. Better not go telling her what we've been talking about. Why not? You know your grandmother. She'll just say it's all nonsense. Winding a ball of wool. Grandad finished his cup of tea, winked at me, opened the newspaper, put it over his head, and went to sleep. Granny watched to make sure he wasn't pretending. What nonsense has your grandfather been filling you up with now? Oh, he told me how he invented the first road from Auckland to Wellington and built it with his false teeth in his wheelbarrow. Granny smiled. If you believe that, you'll believe anything. I'll bet he didn't tell you I invented the first railway from Auckland to Wellington. I shook my head. Your grandfather built his roads so badly, every time it rained, the mud was knee deep and the cars got stuck. In dry weather, everyone got car sick going round all the corners. So, I invented the railway. Hold that up there. That's right. I held my hands up with a skein of wool stretched between them. She wound the wool around and around. So fast, I could see the ball grow. Who carried the lengths of railway line? Granny nodded. My shoulders were much broader then. I carried those heavy lengths of steel and dropped them end to end, all the way from Auckland to Wellington, to make one line. Then, I rode my bike along it, carrying the other lengths of steel, dropped them from end to end and made the other line. It wore down my shoulders, carrying all that heavy steel. Can you come off? I was okay on a bike. Granny wound the wall faster. Not like your grandfather, he couldn't ride without falling off. Under the newspaper, Grandad snorted. I had to join all the links of the railway line together and bolt them to the sleepers. A million nuts to do up. A million? It was going to take ages. So, I unscrewed my right hand and put on a spanner instead. I rode my bike along one railway line with my left hand on the handlebars. One week to Wellington doing up the nuts on one side with the spanner and another week to ride back to Auckland doing up the nuts on the other line and the railway was ready for the first train. Grandad snorted and snored so loudly the newspaper flapped on top of his head as the last strand of wool ran over my fingers. And Granny finished winding the first ball of wool. Her hands were small with brown spots. Now I can knit your jumper. What did you do with the other hand? The one like a spanner? Hung it on a nail in the shed for years. The last time I looked, it had gone. Where? Your grandfather put it out with the rubbish. He was always jealous of my railway. Grandad gave a grumbling snort and seemed to be waking. I'm going to have 40 winks. Granny took off her apron. Don't go telling your grandfather what we've been talking about, Jack. He'll just say it's all lies. Granny went to her bedroom. There was a rustle as the newspaper slipped off Grandad's head. Grandad, did you know Granny invented the railway to Wellington? She had a hand like a spanner for doing up all the nuts. You don't want to go believing everything your Granny tells you. Did I tell you about the time I invented the first train, drove it from Auckland to Wellington? I sat beside Grandad. Tell me. Look at the time. It's getting on. Your mother's going to be here at any moment to take you home. I'll tell you about the train next weekend. Why nobody wanted to shake hands with the stoker. Anyone could build a railway from Auckland to Wellington, said Grandad. But your grandmother had no idea how to invent the first train. The Governor General galloped his horse all the way up to our place, fell on his knees and begged me to do it. Did you know how? I asked Grandad. I soon worked it out. I showed the Governor General how the coal went into the furnace, how it heated the water to make steam, how the steam turned the wheels. Brilliant, said the Governor General. Now, drive it. I just need one thing. What's that? A stoker. Well, get one, said the Governor General. What does the stoker do? I asked Grandad. The stoker shovels coal into the furnace and gets covered in coal dust, soot and smoke. What about the driver? Driving's a clean job. The guard waves a green flag. The driver blows the whistle. Whoop! And the engine starts. Steam shoots out of its ears. Whoop! 
it goes like a big dog. Woof, woof, woof. Great driving wheels turn round slowly. Click, 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 click. The driver blows the whistle again. Woof. And the wheels go faster. Clickety click, clickety click. Clickety clickety, clickety click. The driver blows the whistle. Woof. Clickety clickety, clickety clickety, clickety click. Granddad shook his head. It's a very responsible job driving, but the stoker just shovels coal into the furnace and gets dirty. First time we left Auckland, the mayor put on his gold chain and top hat and rang the bell in town hall. Bing bong bong. Church rang their bells too. Ding dong, ding dong. The fire engines rang their bells. Ding a ding a ding a ding. The schools rang their bells. Ding a dong, ding a dong. I gave the kids a day off to see me drive the first train to Wellington. Were you famous? Grandad smiled and looked down. The guard waved his green flag. I blew the whistle. Whoop! And let off the brake. Woof! Woof! Steam shot out. Click! Click! Went the wheels. Gave the engine a bit more steam. Woof! 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 Clickety click! Clickety click! Clickety click! Clickety click. Woof! On the platform at Papakura, a whole school of children cheered, and their overexcited teachers burst into tears, blew their noses, wiped their eyes, and waved. But their hankies were so wet that they wouldn't flap. The cows all through the Waikato galloped neighing around in paddocks, and the horses mooed, and the dogs meowed, cats barked. The chooks crowed and roosters cackled and laid a second egg. Faster, faster, woo -woo, woo -woo. through the king country. Sheep were so surprised, their tails stood on end. Woof, 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 they went. Woo -woo. Clickety click, clickety click, clickety click. Woo -woo. Next morning, we were in Wellington. Oh, heck. The Governor General gave me a medal. The army sent a brass band. Crowds cheered and the Navy fired a 21-gun salute. Boom, boom, boom. As if I was the king. Did you drive the train back to Auckland? I let the stoker drive back. Did they welcome you home? Oh, people were used to the train by then. Besides, the stoker was too dirty. No one wants to shake hands with somebody covered in soot. Who was the stoker? Granddad got down on his knees and looked under the table, behind his chair. He even looked in the cupboard under the bench in Granny's kitchen. Don't tell her I told you, he whispered. The stoker was your grandmother. She doesn't like people to know she got covered in soot and coal dust. He winked at me and went out into the garden, just as Granny came in from her bedroom. What made the Marlborough sounds? What nonsense has your grandfather been filling you up with now? Granny... You know how you built the railway to Wellington? I said. Well, Grandad told me he invented the first train. And he drove it too. Did he tell you I was the stoker and got covered in soot and coal dust? I nodded. He always says that. You didn't go believing him. I shook my head. I bet he didn't tell you I drove the first train all the way down the South Island from Nelson to Invercargill. I shook my head again. Ask him. See what he says. What has your grandmother been telling you now? Grandad asked when he came in. Granny says she drove the first train all the way down the South Island from Nelson to Invercargill. Huh, that's nothing. I drove the first train across the Cook Strait. Across Cook Strait? From the North Island to the South Island. There was no bridge across Cook Strait in those days. How did you... Easy. I was driving the train from Auckland to Wellington one day, and then downhill from Waiuru, we got going really fast. Woof, woof, woof. Clickety clack, clickety clack, clickety clack, clickety clack. And I saw the Wellington railway station ahead and blew the whistle. Woo, woo. We were going so fast, the brakes didn't work. Did you smash into it? I opened the throttle, stuck my right arm out one side of the cab, and my left arm out the other, and that enormous heavy train took off and flew. Suddenly, there was no woo, woo no woof, woof, and no clickety clack. Why not? 
When you're going faster than the speed of sound, you leave all noises behind. Wow. I steered the train across Cook Strait at about 10,000 feet, came down and landed smack on the rails at Nelson. The steam roared, woof woof. The whistle howled, woo woof. And the wheels hit the rails, spun round and round, screamed, clickety clack, clickety clack, clickety clack. Gosh. Not the sort of thing that just anyone can do, said Grandad. Fly a train across Cook Strait and land it smack on the railway lines. On Monday, I'd drive the train from Auckland to Wellington, fly it across Cook Strait, land on the rails at Nelson, and let your grandmother do the easy stuff, drive it down to Invercargill. On Tuesday, I'd take over before Nelson, speed up, take off, and land in Wellington, and then drive it back to Auckland. Why did you stop? That heavy train landing with a thump made the top end of the South Island sink, so the sea ran up between the hills and made the Marlborough sounds. You mustn't sink the top end of the South Island, the Prime Minister told me. You'll flood Nelson. Besides, he said, it's making the bottom end stick up out of the sea. And Vicargo so far inland, going to have to build a new port. Call it Bluff. What did you do? I built the first bridge across Cook Strait, Grandad said. Blew holes in the water with gunpowder and filled them in with concrete. When the legs were really high, I built the bridge on top. Did Granny help? She's got no head for heights. I had to do it all on my own. I had no tools, so I mixed the concrete with my false teeth and poured it from my wheelbarrow. It must have been a long bridge. So long, Grandad said. People drive on one end, come off the other end a year older. It's so high, the planes have to fly underneath, and it has snow on the top all year round. What if you fell? A boy your age fell off the top of the bridge 30 years ago. He's still falling. He's not even halfway down yet. What about when he hits the water? In 40 years time, the police will go out and catch him in a net, said my grandfather. He was just a boy when he fell off, but he'll be an old man with a white beard by the time he comes down. What was his name? Jack. Is that all true? What do you think? I'll tell you what though, you better not go repeating anything to your grandmother. You know what she'll say. Why the beehive was built round. When I told my grandmother about the bridge Grandad built across the Cook Strait, she sniffed. That man is so full of cock and bull stories, it's a wonder he doesn't start laying eggs. There's no such thing as a bridge across Cook Strait. Grandad said he built one. If there's a bridge from the North Island to the South Island, how is it everyone goes across on a ferry? I didn't know the answer to that. What about before the ferry? Maybe there was a bridge across Cook Strait once upon a time, but there isn't one now. What happened to it? You know your grandfather? His fingers are all thumbs when it comes to building anything. His hen house collapsed, put my hens off laying. His letterbox blew down, squashed the postie's bike. And when he put up a fence, it fell and flattened my marigolds. Build a bridge across Cook Strait. Him? <laughs> Granny gave a little smile. Have I ever told you about the time I dug a tunnel under Cook Strait? I shook my head. I started from the North Island and built the hills around Wellington with all the dirt I dug out. When the tunnel was halfway, I swam across to Nelson, started digging out the other end. The Southern Alps are built from the dirt I dug out that side. I was tipping the last of it out of my basket to make the top of Mount Cook when there was a whoosh and your grandfather shot out of my tunnel like a cork out of a bottle. What happened? Would you believe it? Just because I was digging a tunnel, he had to go and build a bridge across Cook Strait. He dug a hole from one of the legs to hold up his bridge, dug it right through the roof of my tunnel, on purpose. He was jealous, you know. Anyway, the seawater rushed into my tunnel and blew him out the Nelson end. Was he hurt? He got wet, that's all. But where the roof collapsed, his bridge fell into it and blocked my tunnel. There's no sign of the bridge left today. Grandad told me a boy called Jack fell off his bridge. He said it was so high, the boy's now an old man and still falling. Granny snorted again. The only person who fell off his bridge was your grandfather. He was holding on with one hand and hammering with the other when a seagull landed on his head. The silly man thought it was going to do something on him, so he let go 
and grabbed for the seagull with both hands. What happened? Well, he got wet, lost his hammer, and the seagull flew down and did something on his head after all. What about your tunnel? Is there any sign of it left now? If you know where to look. Everybody knows the beehive in Wellington, but nobody remembers why it was built round. Freddy stared at me. Why is it round? Because the beehive's really a concrete plug to stop the water gushing out of Cook Strait through my tunnel and washing Wellington away. Try stamping on the floor. It sounds hollow, like your grandfather's head. Pull out the beehive and water gushes everywhere. Where does the other end of your tunnel come out? There's a school in Nelson that's got a cave under the staff room where the teachers grow mushrooms in the dark and sell them to buy pies and ice creams for their lunch. Which school? I think it's called Auckland Point. Stamp on the staff room floor and it sounds hollow too. That's the South Island end of my tunnel. Do the teachers share the pies and ice creams with the kids? Certainly not. <gasps> Here comes your grandfather looking for a cup of tea. Not a word to him now. Grandad came in, carrying a hammer. I've just built an arch for the rose to climb over. It'll look a picture when it's flowering. Granny looked at me, put her head on one side. I understood what she meant, and I put my head on one side too. Looking at me lopsided, what's the matter with the pair of you? Grandad asked. Isn't anyone going to make me a cup of tea? Old humdrum boils the belly. We were pruning the apple tree, and I said to Grandad, You know how you flew the train across Cook Strait and landed on the railway lines at Nelson? Has your grandmother been telling you I didn't do it? Oh, I just wondered, who made all those steel railway lines? A mate of mine, old humdrum. He spoke fast in a high, squeaky voice, and had a trick he used to do at parties. What sort of trick? He'd fill his mouth with coal and chew it so fast it burst into flames, and smoke shot out of his ears. Put a billy of water on old humdrum's head, it'll boil, and you'd have tea in less than five minutes. Did his head get that hot? So hot, his hair frizzled, and he went bald. He rubbed his scalp with Raleigh's furniture polish, and nobody dared look out of their window on a sunny day if old humdrum was walking past. An intelligent man told him to try and put a handful of iron ore in his mouth with the coal, and chewing faster than usual, the coal burst into flame, melted the iron ore, and old humdrum spat out a long ribbon of steel. He bit it off as it came out, just the right length for railway lines. Gee, Grandad smiled. That's how all the railway lines in New Zealand were made, because somebody was intelligent enough to see how old humdrum could do something useful. Who was that? I asked. Who was intelligent enough to think of how Mr. Humdrum could make the steel for the railway lines? Grandad looked at his apple tree. Hmm, that branch up there has to come off. Who told Mr. Humdrum how to make the railway lines? I'll tell you what, hand me that pruning saw and we'll cut it off now. Grandad climbed up into the apple tree. The only trouble with old Humdrum was he couldn't think of things for himself. Was it your idea to invent steel and make the railway lines? I asked. Grandad was puffing now, from hanging on with one hand and sawing with the other. I suppose it was me. Thought so. What do you mean you thought so? Well, when Granny told me she built the railway from Auckland to Wellington, she said you were bound to come up with some cock and ball story about how you invented the railway lines. The branch fell and nearly whacked me on the head. Grandad climbed down, sorted into bits, and we put them in the barrow. Your grandmother never liked old humdrum's high squeaky voice, and he talked too fast. Once she even said she didn't even believe he existed. Why did she say that? If you don't believe people exist, they disappear. Remember Tinkerbell and Peter Pan? Did Mr. Humdrum disappear? All because your granny didn't believe in him. I believe in Mr. Humdrum. If you believe in him hard enough, maybe he'll come back again. Grandad sat me on top of the wood and gave me a ride to the shed. We'll let that dry and burn it next winter. Old Humdrum always enjoyed a good fire. I can still see him, smoke coming out of his ears, the billy boiling on top of his head, and the railway lines squirting out of his mouth. I'd like to see him too, I said. Believe in him hard enough, and you will. 
Come on, we'll ask Granny and she'll boil us a billy of water on top of her head and make us a cup of tea. No sense of direction. Next weekend, I asked Granny if she had any photos of her tunnel. Somebody burnt them, she said. I think he was jealous. Granny says you're jealous, I told Grandad when we were digging in the garden. Jealous of what? Grandad blew out his moustache and made it look bigger. Jealous of her for digging the tunnel under Cook Strait. Tch, what nonsense. She made quite a good job of her tunnel, only she couldn't get the two ends to meet. So she made up that story about me making a hole in the roof. Why wouldn't the ends meet? Because your grandmother's got no sense of direction. What's a sense of direction? You know, which way's north? I pointed. Not bad. A bit more this way. A bit more. A bit more. Yep, that's it. Now which way's south? Right. You've got a pretty good sense of direction. It comes from my side of the family. I felt good when Grandad said that. Your grandmother now, she has no idea of where north is, let alone south. That's why she couldn't get the two ends of her tunnel to meet in the middle. We were inside later when I asked Granny, Which way's north? She pointed with her chin over her shoulder. I looked at Grandad, but had to look away again because he was grinning behind his newspaper. Oh, well, it's somewhere in that direction. Granny wasn't worried. That afternoon, Grandad said, Now, do you believe your granny has no sense of direction? Mm, I suppose so. She can get herself lost just going to the dairy. Luckily, everyone in the neighbourhood knows she has no sense of direction, and they turn her around and point her in the right way, or she'll never get home again. I once followed her directions, driving from Whangarei, and we finished up in Hamilton. Ask her to go west, she goes east. She can get herself lost between the clothesline and the back door. You can't get lost in your own backyard. It's as true as I'm standing here. I was away from home once, and your grandmother hung out the washing and couldn't find her way back to the house. When I came home, she'd been living in the back shed for a couple of weeks. What did she eat? Veggies out of the garden. She drank water out of the hose. We had an old outside dunny then, so she was okay. She just didn't know which direction the house was. I looked at him. Granny's not silly. I never said she was, just that she's got no sense of direction. That afternoon, I asked, Granny, have you got no sense of direction? You've been listening to your grandfather again. Of course I've got a sense of direction, and a very good one. Not like your grandfather. He once got himself lost walking around the block. Luckily, the postie found him and led him home by the hand while all the neighbours pointed and laughed. It can get quite embarrassing. Do you know, I once asked him to drive me to Hamilton, and he drove me to Whangarei. How does he get on when you're not here? He has trouble. Granny bobbed her head. Came home once, found him lying in the hen house with the chooks. Luckily, there's a tap in their run, but he'd eaten all of the eggs and was thinking of eating the chooks themselves and all because he couldn't find his way back to the house. Just as well you got back in time, Granny. Just as well indeed. I said to him, if you'd eaten all the chooks, that would have been an end to the eggs, and then what would you eat? Do you know what he told me? What? He said he was going to catch the hedgehog that lives in the garden, the one called Jack. He was going to eat it. But my name's Jack. Granny didn't hear me. I wonder if you'd run these next door to Mrs Black's. She handed me a bowl of eggs, pointed her chin over her shoulder. But instead of pointing at Mrs. Black's place, it was pointing in the other direction, Mrs. Smith's. Mrs. Black's? That's what I said, didn't I? Be careful now, don't drop those eggs, or Mrs. Black will start eating hedgehogs too. Learning to read. I found Grandad in his shed, making a shelf for Granny. What does that say? A piece of wood had some numbers written on it. It says, 2 plus 2. Why couldn't you read it, Grandad? I left my glasses up in the house. What did you say it said? Two plus two. Oh. Grandad paused as if he wanted to ask something else. When you were little, I asked him, did you have to go to school and learn to read? Schools hadn't been invented, so as soon as I could walk, my mother made me go to work selling newspapers. But that's cruel. First day, I couldn't sell a single paper, so I taught myself to read. 
looked at the front page and shouted, Lion tamer, eaten by his own lion. Boy bites shark at Nepal baths. Tourist falls into volcano on top of Mount Eden. Read all about it. What happens? Everyone bought my papers. Next day, I sold twice as many. Cow eats farmer in Dunedin, I shouted. Whale squashes car in Wellington. Giant rabbit chases policeman through Christchurch. Read all about it. People were in such a hurry to read the paper, they didn't wait for their change. My pockets were so full, my pants kept falling down. I soon had six sacks of money under my bed. I taught myself arithmetic one night. The next night, I taught myself to write. The third night, Built my first wheelbarrow, took all my money to the bank. On my fifth birthday, somebody invented the first school. Did you like it? I'd already taught myself to read and write and do sums, and I learned everything else by playtime. They took me out of the top class and put me with the little kids who just started that morning. By home time, I passed all the exams and was back at the top of the school. What did they do? They made me a teacher. I taught so fast. By playtime, the kids knew how to read and write and do sums. By lunchtime, they knew everything else and were ready to go home. The other teachers were furious. What happened? They gave me the sack. I was too scared to tell mum, and I ran away to the sea and was captured by pirates. They made me walk the plank, so I fell into the water where a shark bit off one hand and one leg. I made a hook for my hand and a wooden leg, beat the pirates, and went home just in time for my sixth birthday. My mother was delighted when I took off my wooden leg, stuffed full of pirate gold. But, you've got both legs and hands now. I grew new ones. My mother said a policeman was coming to take me back to school, so I taught myself to swim. That night, I was in South America. You swam all that way in one day. The wind was with me. I taught myself to play poker in one hour gold mine. Filled a ship with treasure and sailed back to New Zealand. All that gold was so heavy, we sailed very slowly. I got home just in time for my seventh birthday. My mother was so pleased with the gold, but she said I had to go to school, and locked me in the back shed for the teachers to collect in the morning. That night, I dug a hole through the middle of the earth and came out in China, where I taught the emperor and the empress the haka, and they gave me a ruby as big as an apple, and sent me home on a junk for my eighth birthday. Is your mother pleased? She was pleased with the ruby, but said the teachers were hunting me with a bloodhound. Bloodhound? They were serious about school in those days. When I heard the bloodhound bang, I taught myself to fly. Grandad flapped his arms, and I took off for India. There I taught the Rajah to play footy, he gave me a square emerald out of his turban, and told his favourite elephant to bring me home. Jumbo swam overarm from India just in time for my ninth birthday. He ate a whole pavlova, blew out the candles on my cake, shook hands with his trunk, and swam back to India. On my tenth birthday, I set the square emerald in a silver ring and gave it to your grandmother. Then we got engaged. Are the teachers still looking for you? In those days, you left school at ten. Grandad, why do I have to go to school? Grandad looked at a bit of wood for Granny's shelf again. What's two and two? he asked. Two and two makes four. Thanks. Grandad, you don't know how to add two and two. I do so. Two and two makes four. I just told you that. What's three twos, Grandad? He pretended he didn't hear. How about nicking up to the house and asking Granny if she's going to give us a cup of tea? Granny, I asked, does Grandad know how to add? Your grandfather wouldn't learn his tables, so he can't multiply to save himself. He's no good at takeaways, and he's useless at long division. Did he learn to read? Mm, not properly. But he reads the paper. He pretends. I read it to him at breakfast. Granny, did Grandad give you an emerald ring? Mm, I don't remember. Have a look in the brass box on my dressing table. The one I keep my beads in. I climbed on Granny and Grandad's bed. Looked in the brass box. There was a silver ring with a square green stone. I stared into it. Something moved. Steered harder, saw an elephant swimming overarm with a boy sitting on his head. Over the splash of waves, I heard the elephant call the boy Jack, and he called the elephant Jumbo. Then I must have slept, because Granny was shaking my shoulder. The brass box was back on her dressing table. Come on, she said, I've made a cup of tea.
How we call things by different names. What's this, Granddad? It's my iron helmet. Did you wear it in the war? Nope, I used to wear it at breakfast. Why did you wear an iron helmet at breakfast? It was long before you were born. We just got our first wireless, what you call the radio. Mum and Dad still say wireless sometimes. Well, we bought our first wireless and listened to 1YA and 1ZB. They were the radio stations back in those days. Your grandmother liked to listen to them, broadcasting Parliament. She got very angry with the MPs. She'd shout at them and tell them they were wrong. But they couldn't hear her. Not a show. No matter how loud she shouted, but that just made it even angrier. The same with the news. When the weather report came on, she didn't like it. She used to tell the announcer to do something about it. Did she know he couldn't hear her? She never listens to me. If she didn't like a song, instead of turning it down, she'd sing at the top of her voice to drown it out. You should have heard her telling off the Prime Minister. And then there was Aunt Daisy. Who's Aunt Daisy? She came on every morning, told people how good it was to drink Bushel's tea. She'd give good cooking recipes and tell you how to clean your windows with a drop of kerosene and a bucket of water and newspaper to polish them. Your grandmother was a great one for contradicting Aunt Daisy. By the time she'd sung several songs, put everyone right, told them their weather was wrong, and that they didn't know how to run the country, that their recipes didn't work, her throat used to get pretty sore. Your grandmother thought the announcers and the singers and Aunt Daisy and the Prime Minister all lived in the back of the wireless. I think that. Well, you're wrong, Jack. But it looks a bit funny when you find a grown woman talking into the back of the wireless and telling the weather announcer to come out where she can see him. Yeah, but... Why did you wear an iron helmet to breakfast? I'm getting to that, said Grandad, grinning at me. In the early days of wireless, we had porridge for breakfast. Yeah. And your grandmother would stir the porridge with a big wooden spoon she keeps in the second drawer by the sink. Yeah. One Monday morning, she boiled all the white things, like sheets and pillow slips, in the copper and hung them out to dry. Came inside and was stirring the porridge when the weather announced... Heavy rain this morning. Granny looked out the window, saw rain falling on her washing, and was so angry she cracked me over the head with a big wooden spoon. But it wasn't your fault. Grandad rubbed the top of his head. After that, I wore my iron helmet to breakfast, and she could dong me over the head all she liked. Here, have a look at it. If your grandmother liked the music they played on the wireless at breakfast, she'd beat time, donging the top of my helmet with a wooden spoon and singing the words at the top of her voice. You wouldn't believe the row it made inside the iron helmet, all that donging and singing. Gee, Grandad, there's bits of something stuck all over the helmet. Old porridge, off the big wooden spoon. And look at all the dents. Your grandmother always had a fairly strong arm. But we had porridge for breakfast this morning, and Granny didn't wave the big wooden spoon and dong us over the head. That's because the second war came. We started taking the morning paper, and your grandmother stopped listening to the wireless and read the news and the weather report to me at breakfast instead. Why did she stop listening? People stopped calling at the wireless about that time, started calling at the radio instead. I remember your grandmother saying, It's not radio, it's the wireless. She turned it off and never listened to it again. Never? Your grandmother holds some pretty strong views. Did Granny ever dong you over the head again? Never. I wore my iron helmet to breakfast a few more times, then hung it in the back of the shed and forgot it. It's funny, said Grandad, how we call things by different names and forget the old ones. Sponge cake, eels, and homebrew. Did you see where your grandfather went, dear? Down the garden. Did he take his wheelbarrow? I didn't see. Your legs are younger than mine. Run and have a look in the shed. See if it's where he stands it up against the wall. It's not there, Granny. The wheelbarrow. Hmm, thought so. What's the matter? As soon as that man disappears with his wheelbarrow, I know he's up to no good. Why? You're too young to remember the time he disappeared down the street with his wheelbarrow, came back with it, full of eels. Eels? That's what I said, didn't I? There used to be a creek down the end of the road. Council put it underground a few years ago. Well, 
Your father and that friend of his, Mr. Humdrum, they set a hinaki in the creek, and your grandfather brought his wheelbarrow home full of eels. Nasty, slippery and slithering things, with their horrible little eyes looking at you. Did you eat them? I told your grandfather, don't think you're bringing those slimy things near my kitchen. I'm not having them wriggling around in my frying pan. So he built himself a smokehouse. The smell was enough to make a body sick. It went on for days and days, your grandfather reeking to high heaven of smoke and eels, and that friend of his with a squeaky voice coming round with his wheelbarrow and disappearing down the bottom of the garden. What, with more eels? Bringing more and taking away the smoked ones. They didn't tell me, but I knew what they were up to. Raffling them off in the pub. Then the neighbours complained about the smell. Your grandfather and his no good friend of his were busy running up and down the street, giving smoked eels to everybody to shut them up. Did that stop them? Well, they stopped complaining, but then your grandfather thought of something else. What happened? In those days, a dear old Mrs. Kennedy lived across the road, where the marshals live now. I thought they always lived there. Not then. Well, I like to bake a sponge for old Mrs. Kennedy. It was one of the few pleasures she had left, poor old thing. I made a lovely one, and she was delighted. I couldn't eat my slice, but she gobbled hers down and declared it was the best she'd ever tasted. Then she had another, and another. She said I had wonderful hands with sponges. She tried making them all her life, but never seemed to get them light enough. I said it was all in the mixing, but she was sure it was something to do with the eggs. They were much richer than hers, she said. They gave the sponge a beautiful flavour. Why couldn't you eat your slice? It smelt of smoked eels. That grandfather of yours had been feeding them to his chooks. I didn't dare tell Mrs. Kennedy what the flavour was. What else did he do with his wheelbarrow? He made homebrew down the bottom of the garden. That's what he did. What's homebrew? Homemade beer. I saw him disappear down the garden one day, pushing his wheelbarrow. Hello, I said to myself, what's that man up to? I kept an eye on him and saw he was barrowing clay up to his veggie garden digging it into the topsoil. Where did it come from? He dug an underground hut and made home brew down there, he and that Mr. Humdrum. They used to drink the smelly stuff and sing in their dugout, till every dog on the street started howling. I tell you, as soon as I see that grandfather of yours with his wheelbarrow, I know he's up to no good. He built the road from Auckland to Wellington with the wheelbarrow and his false teeth, Granny. Yeah, and look what a mess that made. Why don't you just ask what he's doing? He'd like that, wouldn't he? No. It'd be much better if you were to go and see what he's doing. Come back and tell me. I walked down the garden whistling, as Granny had told me. There were still lots of plums, so I picked and ate some. That's when I saw Grandad. Hat over his face, fast asleep. He was sitting in his wheelbarrow, so I tilted up and held him up into the sun. I didn't want to wake him and think I was spying. But I swallowed a plum stone and made a bit of noise coughing it up. And when I looked again, Grandad had disappeared. He was asleep, Granny, I told her. Down the bottom of the garden, with his hat over his eyes and lying back in his wheelchair like it was a big comfy armchair. Didn't I say he'd be up to something, said Granny. Can't trust that man at the best of times, let alone when he sneaks off with his wheelbarrow. A lot of blithering nonsense. Don't suppose your grandmother's told you the story of my tunnel? She told me about the one she dug to the South Island. Oh, I'm not talking about a rabbit hole under Cook Strait, Grandad shook his head. I'm talking about the real tunnel from New Zealand all the way under the Tasman Sea to Australia. Your grandmother had it easy digging a tunnel under Cook Strait, but she couldn't even get the two ends to meet. She didn't have kangaroos and camels and koala bears falling into her tunnel. She didn't come up in the middle of the desert, where the only place out of the sun was inside my tunnel. Was it hot? So hot my toenails started melting. I ran into the shade inside the tunnel, jumped out of my skin, stood in my skeleton till it cooled down. After that, I sawed up pieces of shade from inside the tunnel, put them in my wheelbarrow, and sold them to passing Australians to stop them from getting sunburned. When I'd sold all the shade, I chained a team of bull camels to the end, whipped them up, and pulled the tunnel out of the ground. What did you do with it? Cut half of it into lengths, Sold them to farmers for whales. What about the other half? Sorted up, built the Sydney Opera House, 
sold it some joker called Ned Kelly. Few bits of tunnel left over, I split and sold for post holes. Saved people from digging. Were you rich, Grandad? I did alright, flogging off my tunnel. We'd have been sitting pretty, but your grandmother blew half of our fortune buying a racehorse and training it for the Melbourne Cup. Did it win? It leapt ahead of the others, lost interest halfway, chewed some grass, and hopped in last. Hopped? Hopped. Your grandmother didn't know one end of a horse from another, and those Ocker con men had sold her a racing kangaroo. She said she never wanted to see an Australian again. I told her it was all her own fault. Who ever heard such nonsense? A racing kangaroo. But you still had the other half of your fortune, Grandad. You know how your grandmother's a terrible gambler, Jack? She'd bet the other half of the money on her bloomin' racing kangaroo. So you lost the lot. The only thing left was my wheelbarrow. Pulled it to pieces to build a dinghy and rode home to New Zealand. Took a fair time too, because your grandmother insisted on bringing that kangaroo. It sat in the stern and was seasick the whole way. What did Granny call her kangaroo? Jack. What happened to the kangaroo? Took one look at Auckland, dived over the side and swam back to Australia. Last we saw of it, that kangaroo was doing butterfly strokes down the Rangatoto Channel. It came last in the Melbourne Cup, but by gee could it swim. Did you ever hear of it again? Your grandmother keeps in touch. She always gets a card at Christmas. Is that true? I think that's a lot of blithering nonsense, Grandad. Who ever heard of a kangaroo called Jack that sends Christmas cards? The Wild Horses of Rangatoto Island First time I met your grandmother, she gave me a good old telling off in that big voice of hers. Grandad threw a handful of weeds into the wheelbarrow. She shook her head, held her fists in the air like claws, and roared away with her jaws wide open. She'd have lashed her tail if she had one. I thought she was going to bite my head off. Granny wouldn't do that. You don't know your grandmother. Why did she growl at you? We met at the circus. At the circus? You sitting together? She reckoned I hadn't cleaned out the lion's cage properly, told me to do it all over again, or she'd give me the sack. Did you? You bet. Your grandmother still roared and growled and lashed her tail, so I cleaned it a third time. She sniffed then, and she said she supposed it was all right. What were the lions doing while you were cleaning their cage? Cowering away from your grandmother. She was the lion tamer. True? Said so, didn't I? Grandad blew out his moustache, the way he does when he thinks I don't believe him. Was Granny a good lion tamer? She shouted in that big voice of hers, and they rushed to do whatever she told them. But people don't pay good money to see obedient lions. They want to see hungry lions who roar and shake their heads and show their claws and snap their teeth. People go to the circus hoping to see the lions eat the lion tamer. What happened? The circus made me the lion tamer. I wore a scarlet uniform with gold buttons, a top hat, and I grew my first moustache. When I blew my trumpet and cracked the whip, the lions roared and shook their heads. They snapped their teeth, showed their claws, lashed their tails, and looked as if they were going to eat me. People came to the circus in droves. And Granny? She cleaned the lion's cage. Did you make a lot of money? We would have, but your grandmother got jealous. She made me leave the circus and we moved to Auckland. What was Auckland like then? In those days, Rangatoto Island was infested with wild horses. When people landed on the beaches to have picnics, the wild horses stole their sandwiches and ate them. And they even started swimming across to Queen Street and making a nuisance of themselves. They chased people into the shops, tipped over the trams and the old farmers' trolley buses, swiped the kids' ice creams and did smelly poops all over the footpath. What happened? City Council heard about your grandmother's big voice and put her onto them. She climbed on top of the Civic Theatre, cracked a whip, shouted so loud, the wild horses swam back to Rangatoto with their fingers in their ears and behaved themselves. Are they still on there? They hide amongst the branches of the Pahutsukawa trees. Once people get on their boats and go home, the wild horses climb down and go through the rubbish bins for any old sandwiches. Did Granny scare them that much? You've never heard her shout, have you? When we were working in the circus, she trained a giraffe to dance, but... It stood on her foot, and your grandmother shouted so loud, its neck shrunk. Poor thing, the public didn't want to pay to see a short-necked giraffe, even if it could dance, 
so circus got rid of it. Sometimes, said my grandfather, she scares me with her shouting. Where are you? I heard Granny calling from the house. Lunch is ready. Hear that voice, said Grandad. We don't want her to get angry and shout at us, do we? I shook my head. We emptied the wheelbarrow into the compost heap and ran to wash our hands. When people were a lot smaller. Your grandfather's up to something, said Granny, but he refuses to tell me about it. Having secrets at his age is childish. Found Grandad kneeling and looking into a hole in the middle of the path. Put his hand down it, felt around, said something to himself, shook his head, stood up, filled in the hole, and stamped down the dirt. I followed to the rhubarb patch, where he dug another hole, felt in the bottom, shook his head, and filled it in. After another three holes, I asked, Grandad, what are you looking for? He looked around the garden before whispering, A trapdoor. A what? Shh! Not too loud. I whispered, A trapdoor into what? Keep your voice down. It opens into a hole. Where does the hole go? Aha, that's it. You can tell me, Grandad. Mm, all right, but you've got to keep it a secret from your grandmother. I promise. That's what you say, but every time I tell you something, you rush off and repeat it to Granny. Oh, she makes me tell her. Well, I'm not going to tell you this if you can't keep it a secret. I'll keep it a secret. True. Scout's honour. Are, are you going to tell me now? Mm, still not sure I can trust you. Anyway, it's none of your business where the hole goes. If you don't tell me, I'll hold my breath till I swell up and burst like your story about the frog and the ox. I took a deep breath, held my nose, screwed up my face. Hey, 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 we can't have you swelling up and bursting. Your grandmother would be annoyed and make me clean up the mess. Besides, your mum and dad would be furious if I let you blow to bits. I puffed out a bit of air. Come on, you're very red. I puffed out a bit more. My cheeks went flat. My face unscrewed itself. Yeah, that's better. I'll tell you what, Grandad said. I'll go to bed early tonight, and maybe I'll dream about whether it's safe to tell you the secret of where the hole leads to. Next morning, I stared at Grandad all through porridge. I stared while he ate toast and marmalade. I stared while he drank his tea, but he said nothing. Still not talking, he led me down to the garden, dug a new hole amongst his lettuces. His spade hit something. A trap door, Grandad, can I open it? What if there's something waiting on the other side? What sort of something? Something hungry like a lion. Couldn't be a very big lion, the trap door's pretty small. Grandad nodded, and I opened the trap door. It was only a dark hole, and a sign with an arrow pointing straight down, and the words, To China. So that's your secret. I remember somebody telling me when I was a boy that if you dug a straight down deep enough, you'd come out in China, said Grandad. But it's too small for us. Years and years ago, when the hole was dug, people were a lot smaller. You've seen your grandmother's family in her old photograph album? Midgets. I could try wriggling on my stomach. All the way to China. How about we put Granny's cat down the hole? But it doesn't speak Chinese. Grandad closed the trap door, and we covered it with dirt, transplanted some lettuce seedlings on top, so you'd never know there was a hole that went all the way to China. I was careful not to tell Granny the secret, but it popped out when she asked what we'd been doing. How do you know the hole went to China? A sign. I hope you didn't go inside. No, it was too small to get in. Granddad said that your family could get in, though, because they were midgets. Did he indeed? Granddad said we might put your cat down the hole. He said that. Well, actually it was me. You wouldn't have got the idea if it hadn't been for your grandfather and his silly secrets. My family midgets. Huh. He's going to be sorry he even thought of putting my poor old cat down his hole. But it was my idea. It might have been your idea, but it's your grandfather's fault. Where has that man got to now? When you started shouting, I saw him go for his life. He'll keep going if he knows what's good for him. Midgets and my poor old cat, the very idea of it. And although Granny said in her quietest voice, I felt sorry for Grandad. Why everyone pointed and laughed. Your grandmother and I went to Tupor for our honeymoon.
Did you drive? I asked. Grandad shook his head. Not many people had cars in those days. There were service cars, of course. What's a service car? It's like a bus with doors along each side, no aisle, and they carried the mail. Why were they called service cars? Because of the mail service. Your grandmother wouldn't hear a word about going on them because she got car sick, so we bought a bicycle. Did you give Granny a double? Nope. We bought a tandem. Grandad winked and sang, Daisy, Daisy, give me your answer, do. I'm half crazy, all for the love of you. Won't be a stylish marriage, can't afford a carriage, but you'll look sweet upon the seat of a bicycle built for two. We had trouble right from the start. I got on the front seat, and your grandmother got on the back seat, and off we went. But everyone along the road was pointing and laughing. Why? I couldn't see, but you know how your grandmother has to be different. She'd got on the tandem backwards. She couldn't get her feet on the pedals, and she'd had nothing to hold on to. So, the first corner we came to, she fell off. She was so angry, she walloped me with her umbrella. I'm not going to sit on the back seat, looking at your behind all day, she told me. I want to sit at the front and steer. So she rode in front. I sat on the back. We both pedaled hard down Great South Road towards Hamilton. Once we got to the top of the Bombay Hills, I took my feet off the pedals and we coasted down the other side. Your grandmother didn't notice when she started pedaling again. Notice what? That she was doing all the work. She pedaled the rest of the way to Tupor, while I sat behind with my feet dangling, giving a grunt from time to time. We got to the top of the last hill before Tupor, and your grandmother stopped, too puffed to speak. I gave a groan, wiped my forehead, and lay down beside the tandem. She'd done all the work, but I wasn't going to tell her that. After a spell, she got her breath, and we coasted all the way back down the hill to the camping ground. Did you pedal? Not once. It was just a pity that when we were putting up our tent, some interfering nosy parker told your grandmother they'd driven past us climbing up the hill, and I wasn't pedalling. They said they'd seen us coming through Patarudu as well, and I wasn't pedalling then. Was Granny angry? She chased me round and round the camping ground. But I was fresh. She'd just pedalled the whole way from Auckland. She wouldn't have caught me. If I hadn't tripped over the tent rope. When we headed home, she made me ride in front. If I tried to look to see if she was pedalling, she walloped me with her brolly. Keep your eyes on the road, she told me. I pedalled, kept my eyes on the road all the way back to Auckland. When it rained, your grandmother put up her umbrella and kept dry. And when the sun shone, she'd have put up her umbrella. And she kept the sun off herself. I pedalled through the rain and sweated in the sun. And it's been the story of our life ever since. What happened to your old tandem? Haven't seen it for years. Think your grandmother gave it to the Sallies when they came around collecting. She didn't want to be reminded of the time she pedalled all the way to Topo while I sat on the back with my feet dangling and did nothing. Learning to ride a man's bike sideways. Did I hear that grandfather of yours talking about tandem bicycles? asked Granny. I nodded. He told you how I insisted on riding in front. I nodded again. And did he say I pedalled all the way to Topo while he sat on the back with his feet dangling? I looked away and said nothing. Don't you worry, Jack. It's your grandfather's fault, not yours. I thought I'd won, sitting in front and steering while your grandfather sat behind. And all the time he was steering around the countryside with his feet off the pedals and a silly grin on his face. If it hadn't been for some kind people who told me, I'd have pedalled all the way back to Auckland as well. Granny went humph and humph again. But your grandfather didn't tell you how I invented Lake Topo. I shook my head. When I was little, I taught myself to ride my father's bicycle. If I sat on the seat, my feet didn't reach the pedals, so I had to stick one leg through the bar and ride sideways. That's how you learnt to ride a man's bicycle in those days. Ladies' bicycles had no bar, so you didn't have to swing your leg over, but my mother thought they were still too undignified so she didn't have a bike. Anyway, I taught myself to ride my father's bike sideways and rode all the way to Topo. How old were you? Granny looked at me sharply. I can't remember. What I do remember is that there wasn't a lake at Topo, so I decided to invent one. How? I pinched your grandfather's false teeth and took them with me. But he was only a boy. People had their teeth out early in those days. 
took a while digging all that dirt and rock with his false teeth, but when I finished, I built the mountains, Tongarero, Narahoe, and Ruapehu. That'll give you an idea how deep the lake is. It started to fill with water, and when I got back on my father's bike, I rode home to Auckland. With one leg through the bar, with one leg through the bar, and when I got home, I sneaked into your grandfather's house and popped his false teeth back into the glass of water where he put them each night. He never even noticed. When he got up, he couldn't chew his toast because his teeth were so blunt. He had some porridge instead. His mother told me afterwards. She asked him if something was wrong with the toast, but he just shook his head and looked a bit silly. Granny giggled. Tell him that next time he tries to spin you a story about riding tandem to Topol. Soon as Grandad got me alone, he wanted to know what Granny had been talking about. She told me she dug Lake Topol with your false teeth, I told him. She said... She put them back in in the glass of water by your bed, and you didn't even notice how blunt they were till you couldn't chew your toast. Pretended I hadn't noticed, just to annoy your grandmother. When she told you about digging the hole for Lake Topor, I'll bet she didn't tell you about how she was in too much of a hurry, as usual. I looked at him. You know how slapdash your grandmother is sometimes? She invented Lake Topor, all right, but it never occurred to her to put it in a river to drain it. The Prime Minister beseeched me to do something before it overflowed. And I biked down to Topor, whipped out my false teeth, sharpened them on a file, and just in time, dug the bed for the Waikato River. Granny didn't tell me about that. She's too embarrassed. If it hadn't been for me, inventing the Waikato River, the North Island would have sunk under the weight of all that water in Lake Topor. What about the South Island? It would have been sucked down with the North Island. Did Granny really stick her leg through under the bar so she could ride her father's bike? That's how you learnt to ride a bike in those days. Why didn't you learn on a lady's bike if they had no bar? Catch me riding a girl's bike. All the other boys would have called me a sissy. Never be able to hold my head up again. Did you really have all your teeth out before you went to school? Has she been saying that again? It was your Granny. She ate so many lollies and wouldn't clean her teeth so she had all her teeth out before she started school. The last of the mower. I first saw Mount Ruapehu when I was building the road from Auckland to Wellington, Grandad told me. So I climbed it at once before your grandmother heard about it. I had to chop steps in the ice with my false teeth. The cloud was so thick it froze. I couldn't see the top. So I went on chopping steps and climbing till I was twice as high as the mountain. Why didn't you fall down? How can you fall if you don't know which way's up or down? I had to find shelter or I'd die of cold. What did you do? I chopped some blocks of frozen cloud with my false teeth and built an igloo. An igloo? Grandad nodded. I heard cries for help. Here, I yelled, and a thousand lost and freezing birds flew and perched, shivering all over the inside of my igloo. It soon warmed up with their breath. What sort of birds? Oh, sparrows, kingfishers, blackbirds, fantails, you name it, every kind of bird in New Zealand, even a moa. But moas are extinct. Mrs. Johnson said that at school. This one was very alive. But moas can't fly. I asked it about that. First it pretended it didn't speak English. Then it owned up to getting lost and following my steps cut up the mountain into the frozen cloud. Just then the sun came out. The igloo melted and the frozen clouds started to thaw. We were about to crash on top of Ruapehu, several thousand feet below. Birds were all right. The mower and I flapped our arms, but it didn't do any good. Then one of the sparrows said, You saved us, now we'll save you. He and his mates, the blackbirds and the thrushes and the fantails, the hawks, bellbirds and tuis and kingfishers, they all held on to each other's tails with their beaks and made a feathery magic carpet. The mower shoved past me and blundered aboard, squashing several little birds under his big feet. Ouch, said one sparrow. You too, it told me, and I stepped on just in time before the cloud melted. The birds around the outside of the feathery magic carpet each flapped one wing, so we circled and sank soft in the snow on top of Mount Ropehu. I thanked the birds and told them there would always be a place for them to stay in Auckland, breadcrumbs to eat, and somewhere to roost safe from Granny's cat. What about the mower? Took off without a word while I was saying goodbye to the sparrows. The only sign was its big footprints going down the side of the mountain. Did it thank the other birds? Everyone knows mowers don't have any manners. What happened then? 
The sun melted its tracks, so I couldn't ever show them to anyone else to prove it had been there. Bit of a shame, really, said Grandad. That was the last of the mower. A pumpkin the size of a car shed. Told you, didn't I, about the big pumpkin? The one you couldn't get into the wheelbarrow. This one was bigger again, Grandad said, sitting down in his wheelbarrow and pointed. About the size of the car shed. The car shed? How did it grow so big? Fed it on my compost. They took photos and put them in all the newspapers. What did Granny think? She kept telling me to get rid of it. But what could I do? It went on growing and growing. Squashed old Crimson Glory, her favourite rose. And I had to shift the clothesline because she complained about my pumpkin and was keeping the sun off her washing. It was the 1930s depression. People were hungry and had no jobs. My mate Old Humdrum suggested giving away bits of the pumpkin to anyone who wanted to feed. So we cut a door with a cross-cut saw and dug out the inside with an axe and shovel. We gave away lorry loads and sent railway wagons loaded with great chunks of yellow pumpkin to Wellington, Christchurch and Dunedin. Did that stop it growing? It caved in like a basketball that's gone flat. We should pump it up, said my mate Old Humdrum. See what happens. Closed the door on the side of the giant flat pumpkin, and old humdrum used his pump off his bike. But the connection got hot, so we had to pinch the pump off your grandmother's bike and use the connection off that. We pumped for three days before the giant pumpkin stirred and shook itself as if it was coming to life. It's lifting! Old humdrum yells. We pump away, and the pumpkin rises off the ground. I get our fishing net, throw it over the top, tie it to one end of your grandmother's clothesline. We don't just want it floating away. What happens? Old Humdrum slung your grandmother's clothes basket under the giant pumpkin, like the one under a hot air balloon. He climbed aboard and hung onto the end of the clothesline as the pumpkin tugged and tried to rise higher. Yeah? Your grandmother came to take in her washing, saw Old Humdrum in her clothes basket under the giant pumpkin, her clothesline stretching straight up into the air and all her washing flying like flags. What did Granny say? I couldn't hear for old humdrum's screams. Why was he screaming? It's a bit scared of your grandmother. She was shaking her fist at him. He yanked the clothesline and the bottom end came free. The giant pumpkin leapt into the sky and blew away, up over the top of Rangatoto. What about Mr. Humdrum? Last I saw of him, he was jumping up and down, still screaming. The whole shebang. Pumpkin, fishing net, basket, clothesline and washing was drifting towards the Coromandel Range. Next day, Teddy Bronland, on his fishing boat off Mercury Bay, said he heard a yell, looked up and saw it heading towards South America. And that'd be right, Grandad said. It was blowing a westerly at the time. Did you ever see it again? People write to the Herald now and again and say they've seen something sailing overhead with a string of flags hanging underneath. I reckon it's our giant pumpkin drifting around the world with your grandmother's washing and old humdrum. Will he be all right? He's got all the pumpkin he can eat. What if he gets sick of it? Hasn't got much choice. Anyway, didn't have to go climbing into the clothes basket, did he? No, I suppose not. Still, old humdrum can look after himself. He'll turn up again one day, full of yarns about the giant pumpkin coming down in Africa or Alaska. What if he comes down in the sea? We just have to swim home. It's quite good at dog paddling, old humdrum. What if the giant pumpkin floats up towards the sun? Then we'll smell cooked pumpkin. What about Mr. Humdrum? No, oh, he can always drill a hole in the pumpkin with his pocket knife, let out a bit of air and come down. He'd soon let us know if he's not enjoying himself. He's got a fairly loud yell, old Humdrum. Not as loud as your grandmother's, but pretty near. Whenever there's a full moon, I look to see if the giant pumpkin's drifting across the sky. It'd show up against the moon, you know, something that size. Suppose it would, I said to Grandad. The first helicopter. Mum's clothesline goes round and round. I had one of those, said Granny. A rotary clothesline. What happened to it? Like everything your grandfather builds, it went wrong. Give that prop a bit of a push, Jack, or we'll have the towels dragging on the ground. Such a blessing, dear, having somebody to help me hang out the washing. What happened to your rotary clothesline, Granny? I'll just get this sheet over the line. Now the pegs. Thank you. Years ago, I had a clothesline like this, from one side of the back lawn to the other, with a tea tree prop in the middle. 
Then, Mrs. Bragg down the road got a rotary clothesline. Couldn't go to Bryce's store without being told how quickly it dried her clothes, how little space it took up, and how everybody should get one. Next thing, Mrs. Boast had a rotary clothesline. Then Mrs. Vaunt, and then the three of them were in the shop every morning, squawking like chooks that have just laid an egg. Were their clotheslines better? Well, that's what they reckoned. But your grandfather said, it's just newfangled fashion. Build me a rotary clothesline at once, I told him. Not going to be the last with an old-fashioned line. Why not? He wanted to know, the cheek of him. So we got nothing to eat that night, nothing next morning, nothing for lunch. That brought him up with a round turn, I can tell you. Granny grabbed a couple of pegs to hold a shirt. That afternoon, he put in a post for my rotary clothesline. By the time it was dark, he'd nearly finished building the forearms and stringing the wire between them. Did you give him anything to eat that night? A roast dinner. He ate so much, he went straight to sleep. Oh, he must have been hungry. He was up first thing next morning, finished my rotary clothesline in time for breakfast. Porridge, bacon and eggs with sausages, fried bread, black pudding, tomatoes and toast and marmalade. Gee, Granny smiled. I hung out my washing early and went down to the shop, told everyone I had a rotary clothesline, and that wiped the smug look off their faces. Mrs. Bragg went home in such a hurry, she left her bread and paper on the counter of Mr. Bryce's store, and Mrs. Boast and Mrs. Vaunt ran after her with them to escape me. So everything was all right? You'd think so, wouldn't you? I got home, and do you know what they were up to? Mrs. Boast and Mrs. Vaunt? Not them, silly. Your grandfather and that friend of his, that Mr. Humdrum with the squeaky voice. What had they done? They'd rigged up my rotary clothesline with the engine off a motor mower. They'd found in the dump. It was spluttering and coughing, driving my new rotary clothesline round and around. Your washing's going to get drier quicker than anyone else's, said Grandfather. And that Humdrum just nodded and grinned. Works a treat. He had the cheek to squeak at me. I'll give the pair of you a treat, I told them. Look at the grease and oil all over my sheets. That moment the engine raced and the rotary clothesline spun faster and faster and took off straight up into the air. I grabbed the sheet and the next thing I knew I was looking at the street growing smaller and smaller below me, praying the pegs wouldn't pull out. What did Grandad do? Just pointed and yelled, Ha ha ha, I can see up your skirt. He and that nitwitted friend of his, they just stood down on the lawn laughing. Hang on, they shouted. Did you fall? The engine ran out of petrol. The rotary clothesline spun the other way and came straight back down on the back lawn again. But all the gossipy neighbours had seen me, dangling from a sheet with grease and oil all over it. I stood over those two men while they soaped and rubbed the sheets on the scrubbing board till their fingertips were raw. Then I made them light the copper, boil the sheets and blew them. And then I made them put my old clothesline again, peg out the sheets. Next morning, I waited till late afternoon there was nobody about, before I went near the shop. That Mrs. Vaunt and Mrs. Boast and Mrs. Bragg were all out pretending to look in their letterboxes. So I came home round the other way with the bread and the paper. There was your grandfather sitting on one of my good kitchen chairs, tied to the middle of the rotary clothesline. He pulled a cord, the engine roared, the arms flew round and round and it went mad. It took off and chased that Mr. Humdrum across the back lawn. It cut my dahlias flat chopped the tops of your grandfather's potatoes and crashed into his bean row. Those two men talked big about having invented a new sort of flying machine, one that could take straight off up into the air and come straight down again to land. They might have invented the helicopter, Granny. As if I cared, I got my chair out of the wreck, made them take the whole thing, engine and all, to the tip. I had my good name to look after, looking up my skirt indeed. Granny pegged out an old pair of Grandad's trousers and gave him such a whack across the seat with a stick. I knew not to ask anything more about her rotary clothesline. Half a crown each way with the bookie. Did I ever tell you how your grandmother turned me inside out? Inside out? Grandad nodded and put away his shovel. That's what I said. He ran his wheelbarrow into the shed, stood it against the wall. But you can't... Your grandmother can do anything when she sets her mind to it. Grandad shook his head, seemed to be thinking. Why did she turn you inside out? She gave me a warning. First time she caught me ringing the bookie. What's a bookie? Someone who takes bets on the races. And what's wrong with that? Well, it was against the law, bookmaking. 
They could throw you in jail. What for? For having a bet. It's not fair. Try telling that to the judge. But Granny lost all her money betting on the Melbourne Cup. It's a different story when it came to me putting on half a crown each way with the bookie. But you told me Granny bet half a million quid and lost the lot. That's right. And she wouldn't let you bet five bob. She can be pretty hard, your grandmother. So what happened? Waited till she went to do her shopping. And I was putting on my bet when your grandmother burst through the door and caught me with a phone in my hand. Again? Again, shook his head. I warned you, she said. Told you what I'd do. What? I had my mouth wide open, said Grandad. While I was still talking to the bookie over the phone. Your grandmother stuck her hand right down my throat, turned me inside out, just like that. Oh, it must have hurt. Hurt, I tell you. Couldn't see, couldn't hear, and I couldn't sit down. Could you walk? Both feet turned inside out? How long did it last? It seemed hours, though your grandmother said it was only for a couple of seconds, while she grabbed the phone, told off the bookie. Then she turned me right side out again. I was that relieved, I can tell you. Could you see in here? My eyes were a bit runny, and all I could hear was her telling me that if she ever caught me putting another bed on with a bookie, she'd turn me inside out and leave me that way for good. Crikey! What did you do? I swore I'd never put on another bet with a bookie, and I never have. Who wants to spend the rest of his life inside out? Granny wouldn't do that to you. Not for the rest of your life. There's a dark side to your grandmother you don't know, Jack. When I went to bed, I thought about Grandad hopping around inside out and unable to sit down for the rest of his life. Granny came in to kiss me goodnight and I asked her, Did you really turn Grandad inside out for putting on a bet with a bookie? Did he tell you that? I nodded and slipped down till just my eyes were showing over the counterpane. Granny looked at me and smiled. You don't have to believe everything that man says, you know. He said you turned him inside out and he couldn't see or hear or sit down till you turned him out the right way again. And you said if he ever put a bet on with a bookie, you'd turn him inside out again and leave him that way. Who would dig the garden and grow the veggies if Grandad was inside out? Who'd mow the lawn? I don't want to have to clip the hedge, paint the fence and sweep the path. That's what I keep your grandfather for. He'd be no use to me inside out. So you'd never turn me inside out? Never, I promise you. But I might go and turn your grandfather inside out for a moment, just to teach him not to fill you up with his cock and ball stories. Don't do that to him, Granny, please. Uh, all right, I promise. Now you get off to sleep and don't worry about your grandfather. He can look after himself. Not if he's inside out. That's right. I need him the way he is. Good night. Sleep tight. Hope the fleas don't bite. Granny always said that. Sleep like a tree, I said. Because she always said that too. Sleep like a tree, said Granny, and wake like a young horse. And I slept. Making the best of things. Hear that, Grandad? The siren going at the fire station. It makes my stomach go up and down. Mm, that's the rotor going round. The rotor? Rotor sucks in air, then shoves it out again. Makes that noise go up and down. That's what makes your stomach go up and down too. When I was a fireman, said Grandad, we didn't have a siren. We rang a brass bell. On the fire engine, we had one bell on top of the fire station to call us for a fire, and the other on top of the engine. We ran to the station, jumped aboard, and away we went, hanging on with one hand, pulling on our helmets and coats and trousers and boots with the other, shouting and donging the bell to tell everyone to get out of our way. What sort of fire engine? When I joined the fire brigade, we had a brass Silsby, hand pump on a wagon pulled by two big horses, and everyone wore brass helmets. Horses too? Same as ours, but with holes for the ears to stick through. We were very proud of our brass helmets. Every spare minute between fires, we sat in a row outside the fire station, men and horses, polishing them with brasso. We polished the bell and the brass pump on the engine, and the big bell on top of the station roof, and the nozzle on the hose, that was brass, and had to be polished too, and the buttons on our uniforms, and the buckles on our belts. Gosh, must have looked shiny. When we were galloping to a fire, the horses and the firemen all wearing their brass helmets, shouting, neighing, 
waving their bright axes and ringing the bell. People put their hands over their eyes and fingers in their ears. Did the horses have axes too, Grandad? They wanted them, but horses don't wear belts. Anyway, they clanged their brass helmets against each other, struck sparks with their iron shoes, and the bell on the fire engine rang, and everyone yelled. Putting out fires was much more fun in those days. More fun? That's what the firemen are there for, you know, to have fun. Did the horses have fun too? Oh, more fun than us. Did Granny know you enjoyed putting out fires? That was the trouble. What happens? She found out what we'd painted across the front of our fire engine. What? Grandad looked behind the big hydrangea. What did you paint across the front of your fire engine? He put a hand over his mouth and whispered, Hurrah! You painted hurrah? Shh! She'll hear. Across the front of your fire engine? In litres three feet high. Your grandmother didn't approve of that. Why not? She said we were supposed to be putting out fires, not having fun. She said it was high time I grew up and learned to behave myself, got a proper job. When I told Granny what Grandad had been telling me, she sniffed and said to hold the other end of the sheet so she could fold it. Oh, I wanted to have fun too, said Granny. I wanted to ride on the fire engine, ring the bell, squirt water on the flames. But your grandfather said that a woman couldn't be a fireman, so I told him, that's it, you find yourself a proper job that isn't any fun. I fixed him. So neither of you had any fun? Granny folded the sheet and nodded. Life's like that, dear. You have to make the best of things. I found Grandad in the garden. Granny said she fixed you for telling her that she couldn't be a fireman. Fixed me. Next time the bell rang for a fire, my uniform had vanished. Had Granny hidden it? She put it on, run down the road, and jumped on the fire engine, yelling louder than anyone else. Oh, they must have known it wasn't you. With my brass helmet, my trousers, and my jacket, she looked just like me. By the time I gave up looking for my uniform, ran down to the fire station, they put out the fire. Your grandmother took off the big brass helmet so everyone could see it was her, and all the other firemen laughed and said she was a better fireman than me. That was mean. You think that's mean? What about this? Your grandmother and her friends bought their own fire engine, one with a petrol motor instead of horses, and they raced us to the next fire and put it out before we could even get there. We were that embarrassed. What did you do? I knew it was no good trying to beat your grandmother, so I made the best of things and gave up being a fireman. Once I wasn't a fireman, your grandmother didn't want to be one either. What happened to the horses? I mean, after you got lorries for fire engines. They were put out to grass, and you used to see them mooching around the paddocks, still wearing their big brass helmets. Of course, that was years ago. Did the horses grow old and die? I suppose they did. But life's like that. You've got to make the best of things. That's what Granny says. I know. I learned it from her. The hole in the air on top of Ruapehu. Look at this nonsense in the Auckland Star. Grandad pointed at the photo of smoke rising from Mount Ruapehu. Why is it nonsense? Because it says here that Ruapehu is a volcano. I thought it was. Everybody else thinks it's a volcano, but your grandmother knows better. If it's not a volcano, how come it's smoking? It's a long story. Did I ever tell you about the time your grandmother got it into her head that she wanted to climb Mount Ruapehu? Did you ride your tandem down there again? I told you your grandmother gave her that old tandem to the Sallies. No, she got out the old penny farthing she rode when she was a girl in Victorian times. A penny farthing? It's one of those bikes with a huge front wheel and a tiny wheel behind. Where do you sit? Away up on top of the front wheel. Could somebody double someone? Mm, there wasn't any room in front, so I had to bolt a shelf above the little wheel at the back to stand on. Why didn't Granny make you do all the peddling? That would have meant me sitting higher, looking down on her. She made me stand on the back and hang on around her waist. Very embarrassing for a man. Your grandmother wondered why people shouted and shook their fists at her. She didn't know I was pulling faces and poking my tongue out at everyone as we passed. We got as far as Topor and I had to dip the billy in the lake, boil up and make your grandmother a cup of tea. There was no desert road in those days, just a track winding through tea tree and tussock to the foot of the mountain. Your grandmother said there was a road down the other side of Ruapehu, 
So I boiled the billy and made her another cup of tea. She tied the penny farthing on my back and we started climbing. By the lake on top of the mountain we ate the last of our sandwiches. Your grandmother wanted another cup of tea. She scratched away the snow and found some black rocks. Coal, she said, and used up all of our matches getting a fire going. I melted snow in the billy and your grandmother had her cup of tea. Then we got back on the penny farthing. Was there another road down the other side? Grandad shook his head. Jump on, your grandmother shouted. I'll make my own road. She steered straight down the other side of Mount Ropehu, shot through Oakoni, and headed towards Wanganui. She pedaled faster and faster, and I looked behind and saw why she was in such a hurry. That coal she'd lit to boil the billy had set fire to the top of the mountain. You see, the whole of Ropehu is made of coal. Your grandmother doesn't want anyone to know she's the vandal who set fire to it, said Grandad. You'd better not remind her. What happened to the penny farthing? We got back to Auckland and your grandmother hid it under the house. Years later she gave it to the school to raffle for their gala day and the Rawleys man won it. For years I saw him riding it with a suitcase of samples tied onto the handlebars. Then he bought a Model T and I don't know what became of the old penny farthing. And that's why Rope who sends up smoke. Grandad nodded. You know what a one your grandmother is for her cup of tea. Grandad says you set fire to the top of Ruapehu, I told Granny that afternoon. Ah, oh, yes. Granny pressed her lips together in a straight line. And tell me, how did I come to light a fire on top of the mountain? Grandad said the whole mountain's made of coal, and you lit it to boil the billy because you wanted a cup of tea, and it's still burning. I told that man, said Granny, told him to put out the fire before we left, but you know him, he was staring off into space instead of paying attention. He said you biked down there from Auckland on a penny farthing, I said. The one you had when you were a girl in Victorian times. Granny's lips pressed even tighter. Did I go fast, penny farthings? I pedalled so fast, sparks flew from the wheels, and the peat swamps near Hamilton caught on fire and burned for 50 years till a wet summer put them out. Where we crossed the Waikato River, we were going so fast, the heat of our tyres scorched it so dry, it ran empty for two days. We shot up Mount Ropehu down the other side and around Lake Topo three times before we could stop and boil the billy for a cup of tea. It must have been going some speed. So fast we broke the sound barrier and left a hole in the air on top of Ropehu, said my grandmother. You can tell where the hole is because your ears ring when you walk through it. Oh, I wish I could ride that fast. Granny nodded. Penny farthings were too fast for people like your grandfather. I think I told you he never learnt to ride without falling off. So they made bicycles with both wheels the same size, much safer, but not as much fun. Wish I had your old penny farthing. What happened to it? Your grandfather was so jealous, he sold it to the Rawleys men. He told me you gave it to the school to raffle for their gala day. For I told you, said Granny, never to trust a word your grandfather says. What the equator's for? Take a deco at this! Grandad held up a huge knobbly potato. A dead ringer for me old mate Humdrum. He had a dummy like this spud, all squints and bulges. Even the hooter on it. Grandad tapped a knob like a nose. Nearly as big as the rest of his head. Was Mr. Humdrum ugly? Ugly? When he walked down the street, the wires drooped on the telegraph poles, and the dogs howled and stuck their hands over their eyes. Why aren't potatoes round like a tennis ball? Mm, they're usually more oval shaped like an old rugby ball. There, that should be enough. How about running them up to the house? Your grandmother will be looking for them. Granny, I said going into the kitchen. Grandad says this potato reminds him of Mr. Humdrum. Hmm, so it does, the ill-favoured creature. Granny, have you ever seen a round potato? Not like I can recall offhand. Granny scrubbed the potatoes under the tap. They're usually oval, except for Mr. Humdrum here. Not like a tennis ball. As Granny shook her head, Grandad came in with another potato. It's about as close as a spud comes to being like a tennis ball. Round enough in the middle, but a bit flat at the top and the bottom. A bit like the world itself. Why is the world thicker at the middle? We all get thicker around the middle as we get older. That line like a belt round the middle of the world. Grandad, what's it called? The equator. Who put it there? Grandad looked over his shoulder. She's boiling the potatoes. Keep your voice down. I did. I drew the equator. 
Why? Got a belt to hold my puku in, so I thought I'd give the world one too. I sharpened a tea tree stick and walked backwards, scratching a line east across the Pacific Ocean, across South America, across the South Atlantic Ocean, across Africa, across the Indian Ocean, and then somewhere in the north of New Guinea, bump, I came up against something that grunted. Why didn't you look where you were going? I didn't need to turn around to know who it was. Who? Your grandmother had seen me start off, drawing the equator eastwards. So nothing would do, but she must start drawing westwards. And that's how we bumped into each other's behinds, halfway behind the Bismarck Sea and the Caroline Islands, to the north of New Guinea. Ever since then, the world's had a line called the equator round its middle. What's it for? Oh, it tells you all sorts of things, like if you're standing on the equator, and you know why it's so hot, and when ships run over it, they know they're either in the northern or the southern hemisphere. What about where you and Granny bumped into each other? There was nobody living there as far as I could see, and just as well too, because of the mess your grandmother made joining her line to mine. Imagine what it'd be like, never being quite sure which hemisphere you're in. What happened to your tea tree stick? By the time I bumped into your grandmother, it had worn down to about the length of your nose. What did you do with it? I brought it home. Everyone wanted to see the stick that drew the equator, but your grandmother burnt it in her stove. She's always been like that, you know. What about the stick she used? Oh, it wasn't as worn down like mine. No, she didn't draw much of the equator at all. I split up her stick one day and used it to light my incinerator, and she's never forgiven me. Come and eat your tea, Granny called, or it'll get cold. Better not ask her about drawing the equator around the middle of the world. Your grandmother doesn't like to be reminded she can't draw a straight line. How to split a knot. How do you chop in the same place every time? Keep looking where you want to hit it. Grandad swung his axe, hit the same spot again, and the block of wood cracked and split in two. Same way you hit a ball, keep your eye on it. Of course, you want to chop with the grain of the wood. Chop across a knot and you're in trouble. Who ties the knots in wood, Grandad? A tree. How? A knot's where the branch grows through the sapwood. See this one? How it started growing here, and every year after that, the tree grew thicker and covered up a bit more of the branch. And the branch grew bigger too. That's how you get this block of wood with the knot tied in the middle of it. There's a secret to how you split a knot and make it come undone. Can you show me? Promise you won't tell your grandmother? I promise. You sure now? Scout's honour. Okay. You've sawn the trunk into blocks, and you get one like this with a knot. You stand the block on end and turn it so the knot's pointing at you. Keep your eye on the knot and give it a good whack straight down the middle. And it splits the knot and the block of wood as well. Grandad's axe struck in line with the middle of the knot, and the block sprang in two. Just like that. Can I have a go? Here's a good piece. That's it. Stand it on end. Turn the knot towards you. Keep your eye on it. Corker, you did it first time. You've got a good eye, Jack. Have another go. That'll be a bit trickier, because it's got another knot where the branch grew out the other side of the trunk. But those knots will all come untied if you keep going long enough, splitting each one through its middle. <sighs> I'm getting hot. Firewood warms you twice. Once when you split it, and once when you burn it. That's the way. Who taught you to split wood, Grandad? I was clear felling a block of bush in the king country, and I got sick of the axe jolting and hurting my hands. So I tried splitting down the heart of the knot itself, and found it come undone so much easier than chopping and chopping and chopping to cut across. I was as pleased as a dog with two tails. I once offered to show your grandmother how to split wood. She'd teach me how to make date scones, but she said that was her secret. So, she still can't split a bit of kindling with the knot through the middle of it, and I still don't know how to make a date scone. Granny's going to show me how to make date scones, and I can tell you. Nah, that wouldn't be fair. Anyway, she's got you to split the kindling. I like splitting the kindling. Well, now you know how to split through a knot. That'll make you like it even more. Whether you're splitting wood or a knot, you'll go with the grain. Like going with the lay of the land. What's the lay of the land? Same thing as the grain and the length of timber. If you want to get somewhere in the bush, you can follow a straight line uphill and down till you get there tired out. Or you can go with the lay of the land. Following the line of the ridges and the valleys, you'll get there in half the time, and half the effort. 
Sometimes you've got no choice. You just have to go against the lay of the land. Have you ever done that, Grandad? Yep, when I invented New Zealand, I had to chop all of the valleys and gorges through the ridges and the mountains. True? Yep, like the Kauranga Haki, gorge through to Waihi, Manawatu gorge through to Palmerston North, and all those gorges down the South Island, from Bulla to Kota. I had to chop a lot of them through the ranges, against the grain of the country. If I hadn't, there'd be no way for the rivers to get through, and that would have meant there'd be no way for roads and railways to be built through the mountains. Did Granny help you? No, oh, your grandmother's no good with an axe. She can't keep her eye on where she wants to hit because she's always too busy keeping one eye on me. That's why some of the gorges have got bends and twists in them, where your grandmother chopped in the wrong place. Mountains are filled with knots, and your grandmother got the axe stuck in them again and again. I tried to show her on a block of wood, but she would keep one eye on me. In the end, I had to say to her, You stick to making date scones, and I'll split the firewood. And that's what we've done ever since. I can split a knot, I told Grandad. And Granny's showing me how to make date scones as well. It's no end to some people's cleverness. We'll take in the kindling, and with any luck, Granny will show you how to make some for our morning tea. Drawing the map of New Zealand. To hear the man talk, said Granny, you'd think your grandfather invented the country. Your grandmother's right, Grandad said when I asked him. There was no such thing as New Zealand before I drew it on the map. What about when you were a boy, I asked. You must have been in New Zealand then. Not a skerrick. We had a big map of the world at school, and where New Zealand is now was all blue sea. Then where were you standing when you drew the map? And where was Granny? You'll have to ask her, Grandad puffed through his moustache. Whatever you do, don't go telling your grandmother she didn't exist till I drew the map. He puffed through his moustache again, took off his hat, wiped his head, and put his hat back on again. You must have been standing somewhere. Australia? I asked. Oh, I wouldn't be much good standing on Australia, trying to draw a map of New Zealand. Can't see that far. Stewart Island? Nah, Stewart Island wasn't there till I drew that on the map either. Grandad shook his head and looked thoughtful. Where was I standing? Maybe it'd help if we drew a map of my veggie garden on the back of this old calendar. Now, where's that pencil? Draw in the shed first. That'll tell us where we are to start with. And how about writing shed inside of it? What are those things you're drawing? What, you and me? What's that you're putting in now? Oh, that's the potato patch, the onions, the lettuce, cabbages are over here. Mm, that's right. So that'll be the asparagus bed. And the rhubarb. Here's your compost heap. Granny says it stinks. My compost smells like rich Christmas cake. It's all I can do to not eat it. Is that the path? Yep, and that'll be the plum, the gooseberry bush. Ah, the incinerator. Granny says you only have an incinerator, so you can make a nuisance of yourself. She says the moment she finishes hanging up her washing, you start setting up smoke. I light the incinerator to get rid of a bit of rubbish. And who decides she'll do her washing, and then complains? Anyway, I like a bit of smoke on my clothes. What's that you're drawing now? Granny coming down the garden to tell you off. Come on, Grandad pulled a hat down over his eyes. We'll hide in the bamboo. But Granny isn't really coming. I just drew it on the map. Then who's that? You want to be careful what you draw on the map. Well, too late. There you are. Up to no good. I'll be bound. So, that's where my good calendar went. I should have known. We're drawing a map of the garden, Granny. See, this is the asparagus bed. Here's the clothesline. And here you are coming down the garden to tell off Grandad for lighting the incinerator blowing smoke all over your clean washing. Granny, did you know that Grandad drew the first map of New Zealand? But he doesn't know where he drew it from because there wasn't anything to stand on yet. Not till he'd drawn it. And he said you couldn't have existed before he drew his map because there wasn't any place for you to stand. Granny gasped. Never heard of such wickedness. Just because there's no map doesn't mean a body doesn't exist yet. Now where's that man hidden himself? Take your eye off him for one minute and he's gone. Oh, he's eating compost. He reckons it tastes better than your Christmas cake. I'll give him Christmas cake. I came down to tell you to skip up to the house and wash those dirty hands at the outside tap so you don't make a mess of my bathroom. And we'll better give your hair a good brush. Or what's your mother going to think when she comes to take you home? Get along now, or she'll be here and we won't have afternoon tea ready. As I washed my hands at the outside tap, Grandad joined me and I told him what Granny had said about giving him Christmas cake.
You didn't tell her what I said. You know what that means. No cake for afternoon tea. But Mum's coming to pick me up, and Granny always gives her cake. Doesn't mean she'll give me any. Where's that map of the garden? Is there a rubber on the end of the pencil? Rub out the compost heap. That's it. There's no compost. I can't have been eating it, can I? Yeah, that's the way. Cake mixture and compost. Grandad said it was hard work seeing the shape of New Zealand in his head before he could get it down on the map. He would say that. Granny turned the little handle so flour drifted out of the bottom of the sifter. Believe me, drawing a map's easy. All you have to do is sketch the coast, pencil in the rivers and mountains. But making the place itself so you can put it on the map, that's the hard bit. No, I suppose so. Of course it is. And who made New Zealand? With her big wooden spoon, Granny stirred the cake mixture into the bowl. Who made New Zealand, Granny? Granny put down the bowl, opened the oven door, put her hand inside, and muttered something. She opened the top damper and said, Put some coal in, dear. Not too much. About half a shovel should do. How do you know how hot it is? I should be able to tell by now. I've been baking in this old oven long enough. If your grandfather wasn't so mean, he'd have bought me one of those electric stoves years ago. One with a dial that shows you how hot the oven is. I slid on half a shovel of coal. Turn the top damper, the one on the back, said Granny. That's enough. Pull the other right out so it sucks the flames around the oven. I turned and pulled the dampers, and I thought I heard the flutter of flames sucking around the oven and making it hotter. Here, have a good stir for good luck. She handed me the bowl and a big wooden spoon. Why is it good luck? Just is. Three times so you see the bottom of the bowl each time. Did you have a wish? Yes, I... Well, don't tell me what you wished. That'd bring you bad luck. Granny lined the baking tin with greaseproof paper and smeared it with butter as I swallowed the secret wish. She scraped the cake mixture into the tin. I nodded and licked the wooden spoon, ran my finger around the bowl and licked it too. It tastes better like this before it's cooked into a cake. Can't just sit around eating cake mixture, Jack. Wouldn't be right. It tastes good. Imagine what your grandfather would say if I gave him a spoonful of cake mixture instead of a piece of cake with his cup of tea. He'd say it tastes good, like his compost. That man, he probably would. Granny, if Grandad drew the first map of New Zealand, who made the country? Are we back on that again? Oh, I want to know. Well, if you must know, I made it. You made New Zealand? Well, somebody had to do something. Otherwise your grandfather would have had nothing to draw a map of. How did you make it, Granny? Like making a cake. I knew all the things that had to go into it. Just put them in together, mix them up. Mountains, rivers, lakes and plains. Beaches and creeks. And the bush, I said. Did you put it in a big baking tin, pop it in the oven? You don't do that when you're making a country, said Granny. You stir it up till you get the mixture just right. Then you leave it alone. And it looks after the rest itself. Did it cook itself? Oh, you could say that. Is that why it's still smoking and steaming? You know, at Rotorua? No, oh, suppose it is. So some bits of New Zealand hasn't finished cooking yet. The hot bits. Maybe that's what they mean, said Granny, when they say New Zealand's a young country. But like cake when you've just taken it out of the oven and tipped it out of the baking tin and it's still hot and you have to set it on the wire rack to cool. A bit like that. Now, skip out of my way while I pop this into the oven. That's different to what Grandad said. Why, what did he say? Something about you fishing up New Zealand from under the sea. Isn't there an old Māori story like that? I seem to remember somebody or other pulling up New Zealand. Maui, I told Granny. They told us at school he fished up the North Island with his grandmother's jawbone. Granny stood up from the oven door, put her hands on her hips and stared at me. What rubbish has that grandfather of yours been telling you now? He's been saying I've got a jawbone shaped like a fish hook. Well, just for that, he's not going to taste so much as a crumb of this cake. And as for him drawing the first map of New Zealand, ask him who he thinks Captain Cook was. 
Didn't Abel Tasman draw a bit of the coast before that? Probably others before him too. Fishing New Zealand out of the sea with my jawbone indeed. We'll see about that. Muttering angrily, Granny bent down to adjust the dampers again, and I slipped out the back door. I was going to tell Grandad to hide in the bamboo patch instead of coming up to the house for afternoon tea. False teeth and a string of sausages. You promised you'd tell me about fishing. Grandad was sitting in his wheelbarrow, a bucket of potatoes between his knees, cutting them in half for planting. You got me into trouble with that other fishing story, he said, about your grandmother's jawbone. Tell it to me again. Not likely. Ah, oh. all right. I'll tell you a story about fishing years ago, but you've got to keep it to yourself. I'll keep it to myself. Better. I promise. Grandad looked at me. Years ago, we used to row out into the Rangatoto Channel, catch a lot of snapper. Big ones. What did you use for bait? Your old snapper, he's great one for mussels. You pull a thread out of a sugar bag and tie a mussel on your hook so he can't get away with it too easy. That makes him so angry, he bites hard and then he's hooked. What's the biggest fish you've ever caught? Something once took my line out so fast that it smoked where it ripped through the water. Your line's catching on fire, Granny shouted. Next thing, the line burnt through, and I lost my hook and sinker. What was it? A bite that big could be anything. Whatever it was down there, you couldn't hold it on a snapper line. So I plaited three heavy hapuku lines together. The only trouble was, it didn't have a hook big enough. So I sharpened my false teeth on the grindstone. For a hook? Granddad nodded. I baited my false teeth with a dozen mussels, dropped the hapuku line over the stern, and was a bite twice as big as the first. Granddad jerked his hand. I was too scared to look over the side. All we could do was hang on while it towed the dinghy stern first up and down the Pacific Ocean. A row we made going through the water meant you couldn't hear a thing. Of course, your grandmother was making a fair bit of noise with her screaming. We whizzed over the equator, and so far north, the North Pole stuck up out of the top of the world. Then we turned and whizzed south till the South Pole stuck up out of the ice. Whatever it was, it turned again, towed us halfway to South Africa. Then it towed us halfway to South America. Oh, it must have been going fast. Fast? The water boiled along the side of the dinghy and stripped it of the paint. Gee. In the end, the thing I'd caught came up, lay on top of the sea, and water poured off its back. Shark? Grandad shook his head. Bigger than a shark. A whale? Shook his head again. Bigger than a whale. What was it? I was just going to row across and unhook my false teeth out of its mouth when there was a yell from your grandmother sitting in the bow. She'd copied me and put over a plated hapuku line as well. Did she put her false teeth on for a hook? You know your grandmother never admits to having false teeth. What had she caught? Something enormous. She screamed, and the next thing we knew, we were being towed bow first up and down the Pacific, halfway across to South Africa, halfway back towards South America. Did she pull it up? Get a move on, I told her. I want to have a look at what I caught. But she took no notice. She never does. Up it came. Lay on the surface. Water poured off its back. Was it as big as yours? Grandad picked up a potato and looked at it. What was it Granny had caught? Grandad cut the potato in half and dropped the pieces in a bucket. What I'd pulled up, he said, was the North Island. You pulled up the North Island of New Zealand? That's what I said. And what did Granny catch? You know her. Always has to go one better. She pulled up the South Island. Is that true? Go and ask her if you don't believe me. Where was the North Island's mouth? My false teeth were hooked into what's Wellington Harbour today. What about the South Island? Where Nelson is, your grandmother's false teeth were hooked in there. So she did use her false teeth, I laughed. Shh! Grandad looked around the garden. But what bait did Granny use? A string of sausages. Grandad looked at another potato, cut it in half so each half had an eye, and dropped them in the bucket. Is that true? It took a couple of weeks for the water to pour off the backs of both islands, and when it finished it had carved out the valleys and left the mountains standing. Oh, I thought it was somebody called Maui who fished up New Zealand. Oh, that's another fishy story. How do you know which one's true? Grandad looked at a potato. 
I suppose it depends on who's telling the story and who you want to believe. I'm going to ask Granny, I said, and ran up to the house. Building a wheelbarrow and beating a sewing machine. Granny, did you and Grandad really fish up the North and South Islands? Which one did your grandfather say he pulled up? Granny was sifting flour into a bowl. North Island? He reckoned he pulled it up first, before I pulled up the South Island. Yeah, he knows very well that I pulled up the South Island first, and he pulled up the North Island afterwards. That man doesn't have an original idea in his head. Granny worked some butter into the flour with her fingertips. What did you use for bait? Some gravy beef left over from the stew we ate the night before. Your grandfather used a worm out of a smelly old compost heap. The flour had gone like breadcrumbs. I bet I know what you're making, I said. How much do you want to bet? Oh, Mum gave me 50 cents, but I spent it. On lollies? I was silent. Just as well. Your mother will give me what ho if she finds I've been encouraging you to bet. Granny shook her head. You can wash your hands and chop those dates in half for me. Mind you don't go cutting yourself. There might be a couple of spare pennies in my purse behind the clock on the mantelpiece. We could bet them against each other. Granny, did you use your false teeth for a hook? Granny was mixing in the chopped dates now, but she turned and stared at me. Grrr! She stuck her fingers into her mouth, pulled back her lips, and bared her teeth. I squawked and ran back down the garden. What did your grandmother say? Grandad asked. She reckons she pulled up the South Island before you caught the North Island. And I asked her if she used her false teeth for a hook, and she went, grrr. She said you don't have an original idea in your head. Grandad, what happened to your old dinghy after you and Granny pulled up New Zealand? We just made it back to the beach before it swamped, and I had to build a new dinghy. Mm, but what happened to the old one? I needed a wheelbarrow to build the road from Auckland to Wellington, so some of the planks out of the old dinghy went into that. The anchor I melted down in the incinerator and made into the wheel. The oars I used to make the handles. And what was left over I used to build our old dunny. Does Granny know that? Never told her. Grandad took his shovel and I ran back to the house. Did you know Grandad's wheelbarrows made out of his old dinghy? He melted down the anchor to make the wheels and made the oars into handles and what was left over he used to build your old dunny. Nonsense. Granny sprinkled flour on the bench and rolled out her mixture, thick with dates. He lost his old dinghy, gambling with that harem scarum friend of his, that wicked old Mr. Humdrum. What did they bet about? Who could catch the biggest snapper? Your grandfather caught one so big, he tried to pull it into the boat, and it pulled him over the side instead. That wicked old Humdrum grabbed your grandfather's feet, and the big snapper pulled him overboard too. They both grabbed hold of the dinghy, but the big snapper pulled it under and the pair of them had to swim to Takapuna Beach from out in the Rangitoto Channel. Oh, it must have taken them a while. Not when you're being chased by a giant snapper with its mouth wide open and all its teeth showing. Granny opened her mouth and snapped her teeth at me. And that's how Grandad lost his old dinghy. Yep, but he likes to tell everyone he built his wheelbarrow out of it. I knew Granny was going to cut the flour and date the mixture into squares and put them on a baking tray. Oh boy, I said, and ran back down the garden. Just in time, Grandad handed me the bucket. Plant the sea potatoes in the furrows, with the shoots pointing up, and I'll come along behind and shovel the dirt in. Granny says it's not true. You built your wheelbarrow out of your old dinghy. She says you lost it in a bet with Mr. Humdrum. Your grandmother's the one who bets on everything. She gambled away our fortune on the Melbourne Cup, remember? She even lost her Singer sewing machine on a bet. Grandad was catching up, so I had to go faster, planting a spud with the shoots pointing up. Taking one step, planting another. Did she bet her sewing machine on the Melbourne Cup? She bet Mrs. Humdrum, her good singer sewing machine, that she could make a better fish story than mine. Your grandmother's never forgiven me for winning, but she was the one who bet away her old sewing machine. And whose fault is that? Yours, I said. Thought you'd say that, Grandad said. Filled in the last furrow. That's the spuds planted. What say we go and bet your grandmother a bob, and she won't make us a cup of tea? And, I said, what say we bet her ten cents she won't give us a date scone, hot out of the oven? Grandad nodded. She'll fall for that, he said. I bet.
when New Zealand was round. On the old map of the world, Grandad told me, New Zealand, the North Island and the South Island, fitted neatly together in a circle. It was all one round country. You told me you drew the first map of New Zealand, and you said it was the North Island, the South Island, and Stewart Island then. That was another story, Grandad waved his hands. This one's about the old map of the world. Before Captain Cook drew his map, before Captain Cook, before Tasman, before Coupe, before Maui, New Zealand was round, and the North Island and the South Island fitted together in a circle. Why isn't it like that now? You know how your grandmother's never been able to leave well enough alone? I made the mistake of showing her the old map of the world, and when she saw New Zealand was round, nothing would do but she must fiddle with it, pulling it this way and that, till she tore it in two. The South Island came away in her hands, and she stuck it lower down on the map. Then she ripped off the North Island, stuck it further up. That's how New Zealand got to be the shape it is today, long and skinny. Your grandmother dropped some bits she had torn off, picked them up, stuck them back, any old how. That's the way we got Coromandel Peninsula, Banks Peninsula, Rangitoto and Stewart Island, and all the other rocks and islands around the coast. You mean Granny changed the shape of New Zealand? Told her again and again to leave things as they are, but she always knows better, giving them a tug here and there. New Zealand was much better before she tore the map and made it so long and narrow. Why? When New Zealand was round, everything else was round too. If anyone wanted to go somewhere, they just rolled there. You didn't have to buy cars, and the price of petrol didn't keep going up. No stink either. New Zealand racehorses were round. People came from all over the world to buy our yearlings, and they rolled so fast, they won wherever they went. New Zealand was very rich in those days. What happened to the racehorses after Granny pulled the map apart? You can't go changing the shape of the country without changing everything else. Instead of being round, our racehorses went square with a leg at each corner, a tail at one end and a head at the other. Instead of rolling so fast, they came last in their races. People turned a different shape, said Grandad. Look at your average New Zealander. You'll see he's quite square. And once we grew arms and legs at the corners, we couldn't roll around any longer. We had to buy cars and tyres and petrol. New Zealand was all right before your grandmother mucked around with the old map. That night, I asked Granny if it was true that she tore the map and ripped the North Island away from the South Island. But she said, You've been listening to your grandfather again. He told me New Zealand used to be a different shape on the old map till you tore it apart. Sometimes, Granny said, I could tear that man apart. She looked at the photo of Grandad she keeps on the mantelpiece. I shut up then, but tonight when everyone's asleep, I'll tiptoe out to the kitchen and hide Grandad's photo. The Ghost and the Hedgehog Under the big plum tree, Grandad sat in his wheelbarrow. I was going to leap and yell, but the last of the sun shone through his hair. And I saw how thin it was. Grandad, I wanted to say, we'd better go inside. It's going to get cold soon. You know about your chest, was what Granny always said. I opened my mouth, but somebody else was talking. High, fast, and squeaky. Granny and Grandad had described that voice hundreds of times. It squeaked a question. Grandad replied. I backed away silently, till I came up against the bean row. Some pods hung down amongst the brown leaves, so the seeds would fall and there'd be young plants for next year. The leaves rustled dry, not a red flower, not a single black and yellow bumblebee. All summer they'd fumble the flowers, too busy to take any notice of me. Grandad waved his hand, as if saying goodbye to someone. I tried to whistle, but my mouth wouldn't go the right way. Instead I ran down, kicking the red and yellow leaves under the cherry tree, till they rattled and crackled. Ah, so there you are, Grandad stood up as the barrow banged onto its wheel. He wobbled a bit and put his hand on my shoulder. You were talking to somebody. I was. I couldn't see anyone. Who was there, though? Who? Ah, that'd be telling. Go on. Here, put this in the barrow. It's huge. Do you want a ride? Oh, it would be too heavy for you, Grandad. Me and the cabbage. Hmm, perhaps you would. Can I push the barrow for you? Of course you can. Sometimes when I'm sleeping in the sun, I dream somebody's pushing me in my old wheelbarrow. Granny? Nah, she'd tip me out. What about Mr. Humdrum? Would he give you a ride? Funny you should ask that. I was just talking to him. 
but I couldn't see anyone. As large as life, talking fast in that high squeak of his. I heard him, just like you said, high and fast and squeaky, and you said something back, so I crept away, because I thought I was doing something wrong. If you'd crept, you'd listened on purpose. That would be wrong. But how could I hear Mr. Humdrum if he wasn't there? Maybe I was talking to a ghost in my sleep. Ghost? Jack, this is where we dug our underground hut and made homebrew. Plum tree was about your height then. Your granny made me fill in the dugout years ago. But old Humdrum's ghost haunts the place. Oh, I don't like ghosts, Grandad. This one's just hanging around for a sniff of the old homebrew we made 50 years ago. There's no harm in it. If you told Granny about Mr. Humdrum's ghost... Grandad shook his head. She'd say I'd been drinking homebrew again. Did Granny ever drink it? She was a terror for the stuff. We used to hear Granny and Mrs. Humdrum laughing and dancing up around the house. And old Humdrum would say, They've been at our homebrew again! We'd go up to the house, and they'd be sitting at the table, with a cup of tea, talking like ladies with their hats on, as if butter wouldn't melt in their mouths. But we kept a count of the bottles, and somebody was pinching them. Granny? Who else could it be? What about your hedgehog? Hmm, never thought of the hedgehog. Of course, that's who it was. And all this time I've been blaming Granny. Does your old hedgehog sing, Grandad? Like a blackbird. I've even seen him get up on his hind legs and dance. He calls himself Jack. That's my name. Hmm, so it is. It's your name too. Fancy, the three of us. Grandad, had we better go inside? Sun's gone down and it's getting cold. You know about your chest. Hop in the barrow. I can manage you in the cabbage. We'll tell Granny it was the hedgehog who pinched our homebrew. Does she know you thought it was her and Mrs. Humdrum? Grandad tipped the barrow, so I rolled out, holding the big cabbage. Your grandmother would be furious. I won't tell her. You better not. Next time I see the ghost of old Humdrum, I'll tell him it was the hedgehog who pinched our homebrew. He'll laugh at that. Do ghosts laugh? His does. Let's get inside and light the fire for Granny. She notices the cold more and more. I'd tell her she isn't getting any younger, but she'd be so angry she wouldn't cook me any tea. That's all right, Grandad. You could have some of mine. What's for tea? That night, Mum picked me up, and as we drove home, I told her Grandad's hair was getting thin, and the sun shone through it. I told him it was time to come inside, I said. You know about your chest, because that's what Granny tells him. Grandad's getting old, Jack. Granny too. Grandad can still push me in his wheelbarrow. He sometimes dreams somebody's pushing him, but not Granny, because she'd tip him out. She would too, Mum laughed. And years and years ago, Grandad and Mr. Humdrum thought Granny was pinching their home brew and drinking it, singing and dancing. She and Mrs. Humdrum. And all that time, it was the hedgehog. Do you remember a hedgehog, Mum? There was always a hedgehog in the garden when I was a little girl. Did it dance and sing? Mm, not that I remember. Was its name Jack? Mm, I think I just called it Hedgehog. I put out milk and it used to huff and puff and bang the saucer on the concrete at the back door. Mum, did you know ghosts can laugh? But Mum didn't hear because she was busy driving carefully, taking me home. And when she said, What was that? I forgot, and instead I asked her, What's for tea, Mum?